Today's guest is Twain Leo. Twain is the inventor of Census, a universal classification system for data and AI. Her experience includes CEO Chairman's Office of UBS Investment Bank, where she was board observer on over 20 technology investments and created the e-intelligence system. Twain identifies as a hardest and a scientist. Twain, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for inviting me. So, Twain, can you give us a, a just a brief introduction of yourself so that people kind of know who you are and, and where you're coming from? Sure. So, um, my name is Twain. Um, I'm originally from Hong Kong. Um, I've lived and been educated in Europe um, and spent a lot of time in North America. Prior to building um, the Census AI system, I worked in CEO Chairman's office of UBS Investment Bank, specializing in technology investments um, and mostly institutional trading platforms. Okay. Um, and prior to UBS, I worked at a number of uh, data startups. Okay, great. Great to have you on the podcast. We have a couple icebreakers that we like to do with our guests. So the first one, uh, that we want to ask is, what is your AI doomsday scenario? Do you think that Siri is going to take over the world anytime soon? <laughs> it's funny because yesterday it, there was actually um, voice lunch where, you know, a lot of conversational AI designers um, gather and, you know, we talk about essentially the limitations of a number of the speech frameworks that are being shipped right now, whether it's from Amazon or Google or Microsoft. And so our conclusion would be that no, Siri won't be taking over the world just immediately. Um, Sophie, the robot, also won't be taking over the okay. world. <laughs> um, the worst scenario at the moment is actually that um, Elon Musk has implanted a monkey with Neuralink and that monkey is now being trained to play Pong. Oh, I saw the video. <laughs> right. So, so um, this potentially is the genesis of the Matrix. <laughs> the monkey, the monkey, may be eventually evolving towards Neo, where you know all of the sort of like you know, let's teach myself how to fly an airplane might be downloaded into the monkey's brain. Right? Or how to do, you know, flying dragon kick goose shape, right? <laughs> <laughs> Karate might be downloaded into the, into the monkey's brain, in which case, you know, the monkey will beat us um, mm. in those types of, you know, zero sum um, fights. Um, but at the moment, the monkey can only play Pong. Um, yes. So, so the doomsday scenario at the moment is that. I mean, maybe we might just become the human battery cell for the matrix mm. right? at, at this rate. That's, in, that's where we're heading. In this scenario, would Elon Musk be the architect? Is that how it would look? So it's funny because I, I think the original architect is actually Aristotle. Mm. Um, and I see Elon and, you know, most of the Valley Bros being essentially his disciples. Um, so, so I would say Aristotle laid the foundations, um, of his temple, of his belief system. And what has happened over, you know, 2,300 and something years is that his disciples have been building up, you know, essentially this pyramid scheme, um, of Aristotle's. I see. Um, so no, e Elon wouldn't be the original architect. Aristotle's binary model and and kind of what are the shortcomings of that? What have been the implications of that throughout the, the many, many years? So um, originally I didn't, you know, I didn't think of it in terms of Aristotle. Um, mm. As a kid, my interest was actually, you know, to do with Turing and how um, Turing's, you know, machine translation didn't map a model essentially to you know um my chinese language um and you know my french and my german and you know my italian and spanish um and then over the years i started to unknot you know the mathematics and 
you know, once you kind of, it, it's one of those things where for somebody like me, who is very curious about scientific truth, once you actually start unknotting the string, you literally just keep unraveling, unraveling it. And then eventually you end up at Aristotle. Mm. And you realize the origins of, you know, the binary system, which is essentially, you know, this scenario where Aristotle essentially laid down a syllogistic, dualistic, binary deterministic logic where something is either absolutely false, so it's a zero, or it's true, in which case it's a one. And the other thing that you know Aristotle did was that he actually socially weaponized Pythagoras' table of opposites. So Pythagoras had set up essentially, you know, these um, contrast terms for for mathematical definitions. So, for example, rational or irrational, um, round or square, um, long or short. But when Aristotle arrived, what he did was that he actually put in, you know, male, female. Um, and so he, he put essentially, you know, something that was very social and very natural and very um, organic into a very rigid um, polar opposite structure. And then over time, what happened was that the false or the zero became female mm. and the true and the one became male and the zero also became black. And the one also became white. And so what happened then was that, you know, people started to count in a very, you know, binary zero sum Aristotelian way. And over time, you know, then we we end up in sort of John von Neumann's times where people started to think in terms of, you know, cellular automata and information theory in the 1930s and you know 1940s and started essentially to say well you know let's imagine that you know this signal um is a one the what you know this box here and then this one is a zero and these cellular automatas essentially ended up you know getting built up from aristotle's original architecture so now we've ended up essentially with the AI matrix or the AI brain being this, you know, Rubik cube, essentially, mm. with bits of data, right? And meanwhile, here we are. So, 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 so something to be aware of is that, you know, when I was a kid, um, my father loved to take us outdoors and, you know, embed us into nature. And so one of my earliest memories was from when I was about three. And, you know, he was often, you know, always pointing out to us to, you know, look up at the stars and look up at the sky. And he essentially, you know, conveyed this foundational truth, which is that we are made from, you know, sunlight, moonlight and stardust. Right. And we are floating around. Right. As little particles. Right. In the nebula. Right. Like 13.8 billion years ago, we're floating around. Right. We're completely free. Right. We're free to dance. We're free to sing. We're free to evolve, essentially. Mm. And then so by the time that I got to, you know, computing and discovered, you know, <laughs> that the binary system and the matrix, I was like, okay, here we are, this is our natural selves, and then this is a computer brain, and somehow we are having to kind of, you know, fit our natural selves, our natural evolutionary selves, into Aristotle's um, matrix. I see. And his, you know, his little logic box. What are some of the, the dangers of that in terms of the way that it's being applied in AI today? Like, what are some of the shortcomings that AI is experiencing because of that model? So the primary one is a bias one mm. because it's so ingrained, um, you know, the, this structure essentially is so ingrained in, in the way that we do, you know, UX design, as well as data analytics, as well as recommendations, right? So when we look at even something like um, implicit associations test, 
um, or, you know, word to vec embeddings. What we find are these, you know, um, contrast word pairs. It's always black or white, mm. right? Female or male, you know, short or long. Mm -hmm. And they're always divisive. There's never, ever any UX that actually imagines us as both mm -hmm. together at the same time. Yeah. Or even um, a spectrum, this, right? Like, like just varying degrees of something. Exactly. And, you know, and the other aspect of it is, is that because I'm, you know, um, of Chinese origin, the entire concept of yin yang is so first nature to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so natural to me. So if I think about, you know, um, the Chinese word for good, how in Cantonese or how, mm -hmm. right? This word is essentially composed of the female component and the male component at the same time, right? So the entire concept of, you know, goodness and of reasoning is where there is an intermingling of the male and the female at the same time. Mm. But in the Aristotelian world, the female is always the zero and the male is always the one and they're completely separate and they're divided and they can never cohere. And so for me, that is something that really jars when I'm dealing with, you know, um, particularly North American, you know, AI frameworks. Mm. Um, Who did you, you wrote about this, this concept and someone taking it out of context, someone taking the original concept of yin yang out of context. Uh, can you kind of touch on that for a little bit? Sure. So, um, so during my, you know, unknotting the, the mathematical strings, um, I went from, you know, Turing and back to Galton and back to um, Leibniz and Descartes and Aristotle. That was essentially my kind of, you know, logic sequence. Mm -hmm. And I got to Leibniz. And what had happened was that he had somehow in something like, you know, 1666, he was writing his PhD and he had become aware that, you know, a number of the, the leading European rational philosophers were exploring, you know, Chinese philosophy and, and Chinese um, scientific tools. And so he started to essentially crib, you know, like just the philosophy originally. He was just cribbing from um, the Chinese philosophical, you know, philosophy books. And then over time, leading up to like um, 1701, he actually started to like literally plagiarize the, mm. the Chinese algebra and the calculus and the geometry. And then by 1701, he was trying to plagiarize I Ching, right? Mm. So, so I Ching as a, you know, as a um, text is essentially, you know, the Taoist, um, it's one of the core Taoist texts. And Taoism is all about um, essentially nature and the flows of nature and, you know, the whole concept of yin yang and wu si um, and, you know, evolution, free evolution, essentially. And Leibniz, unfortunately, didn't understand any of the principles of yin yang. So when he was reading, you know, I Ching, he, to be consistent with, you know, Aristotle's, put it into the Western schema as being, you know, the hexagrams being zero and one. And they are categorically not zero and one. They're very much yin yang, which is, you know, X, Y um, genes. So male and female, yes. which is yin yang. Um, so, so from there, you know, what happens in terms of mathematics is that Leibniz's misinterpretation of yin yang as being binary ends up then um, putting down the wrong limits within both probability functions as well as Taylor series. 
as well as pretty much all of the integrations in within you know calculus um, so then that affects you know the way in which the AI sets its parameters and can reason um, so in other words you know because of Leibniz's errors it can't actually reason yes what do you think is the technology or like the the next step at addressing the problems with a binary model so this is a huge issue at the moment um in terms of you know everybody notices that there are um systemic biases in the data sets as, as well as you know in the algorithm designs and you know, frankly, US AI community is, you know, somewhat at sea, essentially, mm. about, you know, what should be done. Um, because what happens then is that we, we end up, you know, trying, it, and, you know, and I would say this, is that we're trying essentially to fit, you know, us as round pegs and atoms and particles, free particles, into this construct, right? That is, you know, these bits and these probabilities of, the Rubik's Cube matrix. Um, so, so one of the solutions and one of the potential, you know, um, leaps forward, I would probably say is within quantum computing. And the reason is because within quantum computing, things are not just absolutely a zero or absolutely a one. Um, there can be superpositions. Um, and also there is, it opens up, you know, sort of what we call Hilbert spaces that can enable angular momentum and, you know, different, essentially, you know, different areas um, of the block sphere across which, you know, we can, we can essentially place data mm -hmm. so that it's not stuck in this, you know, binary determinism. I see. So it kind of goes to the concept of, some sort of irony that originally we were trying to model AI to resemble ourselves and that the more we kind of follow this path, it's more like we're starting to resemble the technology that we're creating. Um, how do you, you know, kind of talk about some of the other impacts that quantum processing can have, like uh, potentially related to empathy or AI possibly being able to solve those types of problems where it's this kind of unfeeling, very sterile technology that we're interacting with? So a lot of the, you know, those concepts of, um, well, I would actually call it, you know, not just sterile, but I would say it's, you know, sociopathic. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe and, that's a better way of putting it. <laughs> so, so, so the reason I, I say that it's, uh, it's sociopathic is because there was this fantastic article in, um, in Aeon in February 2017, written by um, Stephen Cave of the Leverhulme Institute at Cambridge University, in which he identified that Descartes had rendered nature mindless. Mm. And of course, Descartes famously, you know, propounded his mind body emotion separation um as as being in terms of that you know um we the observer are aware of our own intelligence and our own logic right and whatever the object that is being observed is classified or defined by us that is the only way in which the object actually has a life right mm -hmm. so so um so it's interesting because then what it means is, well, what happens if the observer is the camera, right? The AI camera, which has no brain, has no mind, has no soul um, behind it, right? And yet the camera is now, as it were, the proxy, a proxy mechanism for, you know, for our eyes, but it has no brain or mind or, you know, experience or you know emotions or you know any sense of love or taste or anything right behind that um vision ai lens so in that sense it's sociopathic because what happens now is that you know the surveillance ai is looking at us 
and calculating, you know, the Cartesian coordinates of our features. And then it's trying to infer, you know, just purely based on our external features, mm -hmm. whatever it wants to infer, right? And when it tries to do those inferences, none of its inferences are actually representative of any of our neurons, mm -hmm. right? So it's making a very, you know, it's literally a very um, sociopathic and phrenological way for the AI to to do, you know, human representation or human interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's hugely problematic because, you know, it took humans something like, you know, anywhere between 300,000 and 600,000 years of evolution of essentially, you know, um, biochemical based ciphers of exchange of communication, right, between between our atoms mm -hmm. to arrive at, you know, understanding, to arrive at love, to arrive at these concepts essentially of community, um, to arrive at these concepts essentially of um, trying to be compassionate towards, you know, each other and to try to build, you know, homes together and rear kids together, mm -hmm. etc. So all of that now is essentially, you know, abstracted away from models of intelligence by, you know, the likes of Aristotle or Descartes or Leibniz. Do you see a situation or a future with quantum processing that allows for compassion and for uh, getting into what's lacking in terms of not sensing the neurons of a human being, right? Like that you're just looking at external factors. Can quantum processing address that type of problem? Yes. Um, at the moment, there are still missing pieces within, you know, within quantum computers. So, so the main one being, you know, quantum error corrections are, is, you know, still an unsolved problem. Um, and my view is that that is solvable. The minute that the Chinese actually correct the, the errors that Leibniz made, you know, when he misinterpreted the, the Chinese algebra, mm -hmm. calculus, geometry, and I Ching, then we would actually have a much more coherent and complete, you know, mathematical model, right? Mm -hmm. um, within the quantum, you know, so, so if we imagine that we manage to make those corrections, it opens up the possibility essentially of doing um, what I would call, you know, complex internal mathematics, and that is a key piece that's been missing for a really long time. There's only been one um, quantum physicist that I can think of, David Bohm, who actually tried to, you know, um, like even conceptually try to think up, you know, sort of internal states of, you know, what is happening, you know, within the particle clouds, right? That actually, um, that actually mean that, you know, the muon or you know the proton or you know these subatomic particles are actually attracted to each other right mm -hmm. and how do they stabilize um so once we actually you know make those corrections we will be able to essentially you know um model much more complex internal and intermingled states mm. i'd say um which would be you know much better in terms of being able to you know, eventually get to modeling, you know, our natural complexity mm -hmm. um, and modeling language, natural language, like as if, you know, it's a quantum biochemical molecule. So that's my, that's my own, you know, personal approach to it is to actually think of language and, you know, pretty much everything in terms of, you know, it's a um, quantum biochemistry composition. I see. That kind of leads me to the next question, which is how does that translate your position on this towards what you're doing in terms of leading census? Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that project and, and kind of what's going on there, if you'd be willing to share. Sure. So um, so with census, it, it's it's pretty much, you know, like my childhood 
you know, scientific madnesses <laughs> um, <laughs> executed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, so a little bit of background, you know, ab about myself, not just, you know, the fact that, that my dad was very much into, um, into us being embedded in nature and, you know, um, reminding us um, about our natural origins from, you know, sunlight, moonlight and stardust. Um, I used to do a lot of experiments, essentially, like scientific experiments as a kid, right? So, um, so Centus is essentially, you know, born out of the fact that a combination of things, one of which was that when I was in my um, mid to late teens, I got a job at the second largest um, chemicals company in the world, right? To do, to um, essentially create flavors. Wow. <laughs> flavors for soft drinks, right? Now, this is, this is, this was great fun, right? So when you're 17 and you're let loose in a lab to <laughs> make concoct soft drinks, right? It's the best thing ever. So one year I tried to make a lava lamp of a drink, like, <laughs> yeah, like, like, like literally, um, I, so it was essentially like, um, orange spheres suspended inside an apple juice that was carbonated. Wow. And there's all, yeah. And there's all kinds of like, you know, chemistry that you have to figure out because, um, carbonation, right. And then trying to essentially get, um, the viscosity of the orange spheres, not to be too much so that they collapse. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's complex, but it's, <laughs> it was like, it was like, it was like mad fun. I'm um, trying to and envision it a little bit. And I just keep getting like a picture <laughs> of like egg yolks and white, like egg whites kind of like. Ex ex <laughs> <laughs> it was exactly like, you know, my lava lamp <laughs> of a soft drink. Right. Yeah. And, um, and then, and then when I was 18, because, you know, the legal age of being able to, to consume alcohol is 18. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh yes, this means now I get to play, <laughs> I get to make so then I was like, oh, now I get to make all of the Alka Pops, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so then I, you know, spent some time essentially synthesizing, you know, our versions of, you know, um, sort of Bacardi Breezer types, mm -hmm. right? Um, or glue vines, that type of thing. Okay. So, so the chemistry thing has, you know, has always informed, you know, has essentially informed me as, um, as a computer scientist. And so with, with census, I've tried to make the entire experience pretty much work like, you know, a quantum biochemical, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so if I can show you, let me just share my screen and I can show you even something as simple as, um, user interaction, right? Okay. Yeah. I'd like to see it. And for the people in, uh, for our audio listeners, we're going to just try to describe what we're seeing on the on the screen. But if you're really curious, you can also check it out on YouTube. So we're currently looking at a screen share uh, of Census, the the website. So so Census is essentially about crowdsourcing subjective perceptions. Mm. Because one of the, the papers that I wrote as a teenager in business school was my idea that subjective perceptions actually drive consumption um, and drive a lot of decision making. Mm -hmm. And I used to have these debates with you know, my, my economics professor. And it's funny because yesterday he actually contacted me out of the blue and said, you know, what are you up to? And I said, well, you remember those teenage papers I wrote where I disagreed with Adam Smith? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes. Um, and, you know, he'd very kindly, like, awarded me, like, you know, an A+, plus, which is, like, the, the highest mark in class, mm -hmm. right? I was like, so, so I took my teenage disagreement with Adam Smith and I put it into computational system. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was like, okay. Um, because, because I had this thesis essentially that, you know, um, our subjective and cultural perceptions actually inform a lot of the way in which, you know, we understand the world. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and you know the decisions that we make about everything whether it's about you know why we're buying a particular financial product or you know why we are you know repurchasing you know those shoes and not other shoes mm -hmm. um and what i noticed about you know um a lot of data within ai was that it's actually missing a lot of the subjective and cultural factors mm -hmm. that go into consumption yeah I mean, as a, so as a person with a marketing background, I can completely understand where you're coming from in terms of trying to understand people's perceptions of things, their motivations and for purchase and everything like that. Exactly. And, and I wasn't finding anything, you know, whether it was within the, you know, rational canon. So rational canon usually kind of tells you to measure, you know, interest rates or, you know, price yields or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a time series or whatever. And because I'm such a, you know, um, creative, linguistic, artistic person. I was like, but where's the subjective perceptions and where's the cultural ciphers, right? Um, so I literally, <laughs> because I couldn't find it anywhere else, I literally, you know, built it myself. Um, so with sensors, this is essentially, you know, um, you can, so, so this is on product, but let me go to brand. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, now remember, you know, what we said earlier about, you know, binary, you know, you either have to choose one or other, mm -hmm. right? Well, if you notice here, I've got both, okay. right? Yeah. It's, ev it's even something as simple as having the option of both mm -hmm. actually helps to de-bias a system, right? Because the minute that you only have the option of it being a male or a female, right you're already you're almost you know you're already reinforcing aristotle's bias mm -hmm. right so if you have an option of both right here what happens is that you end up essentially changing the way that the data is distributed mm -hmm. right and it means that you can then essentially you know over time you can track the change in the consumer's perception about you know any brand, any product, any word term, right? In terms of, is this, you know, brand product or word term more appealing to, you know, either gender or both genders, or, you know, you can essentially structure the genders in a way that is much more inclusive and that is not preset to, you know, Aristotle's binary bias, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's example with, you know, brand, uh, brand identification, um, and then you can go into it in a much richer context of having adjectives, for example. And you're saying that, well, you know, Robin Hood might be not for you, mm -hmm. but Aunt Financial might be, wow, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're crowdsourcing all of these data points, and obviously you can generate different types of uh, data representations and visualizations. And you can really drill down and get in really granular in terms of you know, specific adjectives or specific nouns or specific um, verbs, specific, uh, yeah, verbs, um, adverbs. And, you know, you can start to make comparisons with your friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, which particular brand is on the perception leaderboard mm -hmm. at any, you know, in real time at any, you know, for whatever reason it might be. Um, and you can essentially, you know, plot the kinds of adjectives that actually move you, yeah. right? So that's just for like, you know, um, a small group or, you know, from there you can grow it into like, you know, a, a much bigger audience essentially. Um, so in all cases, it's capturing, you know, all of the qualia that's been missing mm -hmm. from, you know, a lot of economics modeling and, you know, consumptions modeling and recommendations for what we would say in using English parlance, Donkeys, aeons, ages. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So, so, and again, you know, it 
it's that fluidity of movement, right? Where I'm not, you know, presetting whatever you as a user um, decide to put into, um, you know, decide to put into it, Mm -hmm. It into the system. So it will track on a much more granular level, essentially. It kind of reminds me a little bit, like when I was in psychology class in university, just the concept of these false dichotomies that are created by either or questions, it becomes so easy to just make a snap judgment. But as soon as a third option, even if it's completely unrelated to the other two options, causes you to just stop and evaluate in a much more, I would say, careful way. Uh, and really understand the relationship between the different answers. That, that's the exact thing. And, and you know, as I was doing my, my research, you know, obviously I, I read around about, uh, and, you know, what I'm sharing on screen at the moment is, you know, how this changes essentially, you know, recommendations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because then, you know, your recommendations are much more based on, you know, um, culture and subjectivity and everything is much much more intermingled and there is no such concept of you know putting somebody into you know binary box mm-hmm. right or essentially you know limiting somebody according to some cognitive science model that might not be representative of their culture mm-hmm. right because something that I read um, around about um, was these ideas of weird, right? Yeah. So I'm just I'm just gonna switch off the the screen sharing. Okay. Is it off? It is. Yeah, it's off. Okay. Um. And and so, the the weird problem is where a lot of the cognitive science models have been created by um, North American professors with the American lens, mm-hmm. and. Something that I was aware of in business school was because, you know, in, in business school, you know, my classmates were from all over in terms of, you know, they're from like Asia, Asia Pacific. Mm-hmm. Some of them were American. Some of them, you know, had, had um, you know, gone to boarding school in, um, in England. And then, you know, or some of them were like from Egypt or, you know, all across, you know, continental Europe. And the the text that we were reading was like a combination essentially of, you know, um, classical economics from, you know, Adam Smith, you know, combined with like, you know, interjections of, um, Friedman, right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all of those guys. And, um, and I was like, but where is my Asia Pacific, you know, Mm -hmm. like, where's my Asia Pacific lens on this. Right. Um, and so, and so I think that's also why my economics professor, um, you know, decided to give me an A plus because I like for one of my ISLM essays, I literally went and dug out this, these obscure, like the, the most obscure, <laughs> obscure research possible, which was like, so the Italian propensity for saving is, you know, what it is. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the Chinese propensity of sa- for saving is very different because, there are cultural factors involved, mm-hmm. right? Even in terms of, you know, North Americans um, preferring to do hard purchase, whereas the Chinese preferring to pay just, you know, straight out if they have cash, mm-hmm. they'll buy it. You know, all of these very, very subtle and nuanced um, signals essentially have not been, you know, metrified, mm-hmm. like in a scientific system, right? So, so that was one of my things, right? Yeah. In, as a teenager, was like, aha, you know, there's missing information. And one of the things about, you know, being a scientist is that you know that the way in which you set up the experiment will then affect, um, you know, the outcomes and the recommendations, right? Mm-hmm. And the results of, of the experiment. So, If you have a psychology experiment that defaults to only, you know, one of two options, Mm -hmm. even then you're already pre-biasing the data that then goes in, you know, to the, to the algorithm. Exactly. And then that loops 
back into, you know, the system. And so then, you know, it, it's literally like, you know, bias on loop, mm -hmm. right? It's true. And one of the things that is a, is a huge problem is that a lot of data sets that are being utilized are being shared, right? So then those become dispersed across countries, industries, markets. It just becomes kind of widespread before you even realize that the problem exists. Yeah, it, it's so. So my MO on most things is that I actually prefer the individual, mm -hmm. right, to to be able to own, you know, have agency essentially, mm -hmm. right, over how they define, you know, anything and everything, right. And part of that is to do with, you know, my my creative and you know artistic side, mm -hmm. right? Because Leonardo da Vinci says, you know, all of our knowledge has its origins in our perceptions, mm -hmm. right? And by perceptions, what he also means is, you know, our internal you know, states and responses and evolution, right? When, like, when we're gazing upon something, right, we actually, like, viscerally have these, you know, distillations, like internal distillations, chemical reactions towards whatever it is we're observing, whether it's, you know, a work of art, whether it's, you know, interacting with another person, whether it is, you know, the best, absolutely the best, um, the, the best, you know, red bean and coconut ice pudding in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, and and so and so for me, this is the other reason why I'm, you know, I'm my system and I are fighting back against, you know, against um, Aristotle's autocracy, mm -hmm. right? Because I fundamentally believe, you know, in in us as you know as humans as individuals as collectives as communities to actually self-define you know our identities right mm -hmm. about and our perceptions of any object um so so the fact that you know so the fact that aristotle like from 2300 years away is sort of imposing you know his binary conditions on me i think of that as being some kind of like you know, mental slavery. Mm. <laughs> and, and I'm not into, you know, Aristotle's, you know, mental slavery, mm -hmm. essentially. I'd rather us, <laughs> I'd rather us have the freedom to essentially, you know, um, to essentially um, self-define and collectively define things and to make sense, you know, for, for our era, not be stuck in, you know, 350 BC. It's true. I mean, I think that the, that the practice that you show of not just accepting something as a given is something extremely important because I think a lot of people just say like, well, like computers are kind of written in zeros and ones, right? Like that's just the way it is. And then it takes, I think, special people to talk about like, well, does it have to be that way, right? Does it need to continue that? Because that might not have been the best way all along. It was effective to, to do what it did but does it need to continue, right? So I think that it's it's really, you know, admirable kind of the way that you approach these things. Um, we've talked a little bit about this. I, I think that it's kind of been brought up, up here and there, just the role that art has played in your life and in your work. I'd like to kind of hear like, where did that start and how has it kind of impacted uh, what you're doing now since it's just the way that you perceive the future of AI also. So with with uh, artwork, I've I've always you know absolutely loved um, textures and you know visuals and then just you know very visceral um, reactions towards you know whatever I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and. My dad actually, you know, encou encouraged that a lot as well. Um, so, you know, we always had, I, 
you know, when you're a kid, you don't have a lot of pocket money, right? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> unless you do chores, right? And it's like, okay, if you help make the to the tofu, so so my parents used to make, you know, um, their own tofu, and it was like, if you make the tofu really well, you might get like a crayon set or whatever, okay. right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> So this was their early, you know, reward and reinforcement system. Um, and so I would, you know, I was always like try to make the best tofu so that I could get my art kit. Um, but I just, you know, I, I just absolutely love, you know, just generally, I love being able to be expressive and expansive, right? Whether it's in the way that I think or the way that I solve problems and so on. Um, and... I, I've actually got a little recent, you know, like scribblings or doodlings I've done. You can see that. Mm. Um, and so, you know, with art, you can go from, you know, something that's just a standard template, right? So I had like these four standard templates. But the thing about artists is that, you know, we're complete, o completely open minded in terms of imagination, in terms of color, in terms of context, in terms of dimension. Mm. And even though the piece of paper is actually flat, you can actually change it and you can transform it, right? And even, even though it's the same, it's like a singular template, right? You can change it to like young me with a blue face, almost like as if I'm Aladdin's genie, right? Yeah. And then this is, this is the Wicked Witch of the West, yeah. right? And you change the shape form just essentially by, you know, tonal shading. Right. And then this is kind of like Amber Heard meets Sheryl Crow meets, you know, Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. So. So the thing about, you know, art is and it's the same with AI, because most people in AI, most AI engineers, they're very they're actually very rigid in the way that they, you know, think in terms of, you know, toolkits. And so that is how. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we ended up with their matrix, right? Because mm -hmm. they go, oh, well, Aristotle has started us off here and we're just going to keep building on him because, you know, just because that's the tool we have. Mm -hmm. Whereas for somebody like me, I'm like, well, are humans shaped like, you know, flat bits and probabilities or are humans, you know, made from atoms and particles mm -hmm. so the minute that you start thinking oh yeah humans are shaped from you know atoms particles and you know chemical molecules right immediately everything about your system is as you know human representative creative imaginative fun um coherent natural mm -hmm. as possible absolutely yeah i think that it's a really interesting way to get to art from science like that the two can be so intertwined with each other right like you understand humans as these just complex beings that are extremely difficult to narrow down to you know flat bits like you said and that there's like a beauty in that right and then that beauty of that complexity kind of can inspire you um, in a way. So, um, but, also, but also because, you know, I mean, I was lucky because very early on, so I was eight at the time, my dad actually showed me um, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man mm -hmm. as part of his um, lessons on photography. And my dad was my dad knew that I was really interested in art, but uh, that I was also a very mathematical kid. So for him, it was a way to sort of like teach me about, you know, perspectives and proportions and, you know, and light and shade and yin and yang and all of those things. And it later, you know, really helped me in terms of, you know, um, my own system. And then and the other thing was, as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is amazing. Mm. How did how does he fit a man into a square and a sphere at the same time? <laughs> like and and you know it's it's like this is a puzzle, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so then I spent a lot of, you know, I've subsequently spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, the mathematics of it and what does it mean? 
And I had this epiphany um, around about the time I was like 14 or 15, right? Because in class, so I was in physics class, and they were, you know, teaching us about Schrodinger and Schrodinger's cat and how the cat was dead and alive. And then, like, the light bulb went off in me. I was like, oh, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is also Schrodinger's cat, mm. right? Because in the T-shaped, he is actually, like, in a static position, mm. right? But in the star jump, he's actually in the active position. So that one picture is actually the depiction. It's like probably the first ever Western depiction, essentially, of a superposition mm. where he is both dead and active at the same time. Mm. And it's also kind of like a yin yang situation, right? Where in the T, he's a yang. And then in the um, star shape, you know, he's a yin. Mm -hmm. This this is my reasoning. Um, so, so art, you know, has always um, and will always play a huge, you know, part in the way that I, I think, um, you know, and I, I spent most of my 20s, essentially, I, <laughs> I had this, I had this crazy list where, um, where like every birthday I had to be in either a Guggenheim, right, mm -hmm. or like a major gallery. Um, so, so like literally, you know, every birthday I would end up like in Guggenheim, Venezia, in Guggenheim, New York, right, in Guggenheim, Berlin, mm -hmm. um, or I would go to like, you know, um, Del Prado or the Uffizi. Um, I only have like one major um, art gallery that's missing, which is um, the Hermitage. Mm. Wow. Okay. So is that on your bucket list, the Hermitage? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm like this. Is, this is like as soon as you know, as as soon as COVID restrictions are lifted, Saint Petersburg is like you know my first destination. I see. Um, and the one that I've visited the most, like the the place that I've visited the most, um, is Venice because I just love you know being able to like literally sit on the floor of the Academia. Mm and sketching, wow. right? Um, or going to like the, the Grand Scuola where, you know, um, uh, Tintoretto, right? Tintoretto's works are. Um, or going to, you know, the Da Vinci Museum, right? Or sitting in the gardens of the, the Guggenheim Venezia, you know, and with the view of the canal. That's like, that's like my, my most favorite experience in the world is just sitting there wow you know watching the canal life go by it sounds amazing and i feel like if i tried to do the same thing and take a sketchbook and sketch it would just not turn out the same way <laughs> no it, it's it you'd be amazed so many people you know um discover their hidden um you know artistic talents and they're actually like, you know, much better artists than, you know, they give themselves credit for. And the other thing about art is that there's no pre it's not like, in, in a lot of ways, it's not like mathematics mm -hmm. where you have to be, you know, sort of like set or, or uh, you know, sort of limited essentially by some of the math, some of the math tools. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. There's much more, <laughs> there's much more freedom because art is essentially about you know, self-expression, self-expression and, you know, evolution. Um, and everybody can do, you know, self-expression and evolution. Thank you. I, I appreciate the encouragement. I may, I may just try it sometime and see if there's a hidden Think artist. Um, before we, we wrap up, I'd like to just ask a couple uh, more questions um, and just kind of get your take on it. So what is your vision for... AI 10 years from now in terms of maybe the technology that you interact with on a on a daily basis or just the industry at large so within 10 years um what i see in terms of you know i'm really hopeful because what i see in china in terms of you know quantum computing gives me tremendous optimism mm. 
and the reason is because the there are you know essentially five or six different types of, of quantum computing um, in terms of you know hardware choices as well as you know compiler choices and I, and my instinct is that you know the Chinese are making you know good choices mm -hmm. in terms of you know hardware compiler and and um, you know front end software as well and also because you know it opens up the the possibility of us really to model natural language as it should be because one of the corrections you know to Leibniz's errors is that he had no context essentially of you know what Chinese writing is about mm. and about you know the beauty, the elegance, and the flow, and you know the radicals and the composition. Literally, Chinese is you know is an atomic composition, mm. right? As a language, it's a it's an atomic composition. So the fact that the Chinese you know quantum folks have been able to port qubits, which are multi-dimensional particles essentially photons mm -hmm. um gives me tremendous hope that essentially that you know we will actually be able to model pretty much every single radical and every single stroke of the chinese language as it naturally mm -hmm. is and not you know not as these flat bits yeah. right um so that's that's my greatest hope for you know, for quantum computing, with over the next decade, is that we will actually have the tools to do natural language modeling. Mm -hmm. um, that it's much more representative of every culture, every culture's meaning, every culture's values that have been built up over you know three hundred thousand to six hundred thousand years, mm -hmm. and so that you know none of us are constrained by you know. Aristotle's rules, right? Where our languages are actually defined by, you know, our own cultural sensibilities mm -hmm. um, in situ. I see. I, that's a, I think that that's a good vision for the future. Um, I have one last question that we try, okay. we try to ask everybody, uh, which is, what is a misconception that you that a lot of people may have about AI that you'd kind of like to clear up or set the record straight on? Oh, <laughs> the, oh, there are so many, but here's the biggie, okay. yeah. right? The biggie is this: is that the US AI bros are confusing. Yeah, I I like to tease them a lot because you know because they make an awful lot of mistakes like <laughs> you know within mathematics uh -huh. and plus and plus they're not artistic and creative mm. and you know um and they keep perpetuating biases so i feel i feel that you know i feel that i i can call them ai bros um, That's fair. so so the ai bros um their their major problem is that they confuse and conflate information theory with intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, information theory, as defined by Claude Shannon, is the negative reciprocal value of probability, which is a scalar, mm -hmm. right? Meanwhile, it's a scalar metric. Meanwhile, our intelligence is not scalar mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form, right? So, so that is a major misconception is when you confuse information with intelligence and then you try to retrofit intelligence to information mm. theory. Um, and the other aspect of it, it uh, you know, the other aspect of information theory and, you know, probability is this, is that probability as a math tool was originally invented to measure and model the random behavior of non-thinking artifacts such as coins, dice, mm -hmm. chess, go pieces, bridges, um, houses, and so on. Mm. 
Now, <laughs> if any of the AI bros want to um, put themselves under, you know, a neurosurgeon's knife so that we can open up their brains to check if they have dice or coins, etc., uh -huh. <laughs> inside their brains, right? As a basis of their intelligence, mm -hmm. then you know we should encourage that, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because because then that that would stop that would essentially like stop them from proxying human neurons and human intelligence as their matrices and their god dice, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so essentially, you know, that would wake them up to try to model, you know, our intelligence as naturally and as coherently and as universally and as adaptively and as, you know, in a very evolutionarily um, complex way, right? Yes. That, that they should, instead of continuing to build, you know, bigger and bigger matrices like these. I see. Well, I think that you've given maybe some of the best answers to these questions that, that I've experienced so far. So I appreciate your thoughtfulness. It was a lot of fun being able to talk to you today. And I think that the work that you're doing and the perspective that you're bringing to the industry is extremely valuable and, and worth listening to. So I appreciate that you were willing to come on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me, Mark. And shout out to Beth mm -hmm. and Terry. Um, for connecting us. I love Beth. Um, and uh, yeah, I, AI should be fun, mm -hmm. just as art is fun, just as being human is fun. Um, so the sooner that, you know, we can actually create AI that represents, you know, human funness and human inventiveness and, you know, our complexity, the better, and our naturalness, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you know, Mars Cloud's audience and the wider Shenzhen community. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, Beth is the CEO of Pat Inc. And we just had John, the CTO, on the podcast recently. And so one last question for you before we go is if people wanted to learn more about what you're doing, um, where can they find you? So I'm quite an active tweeter. Um, so I'm at Twainus, uh, T-W-A-I-N-U-S. Um, they can also, um, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I also share, you know, a lot of, um, my perspectives on LinkedIn as well. Okay. And we can include so those I'm links in the, uh, in the description as well. So people can find you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Twain. It was great chatting. Thanks, Mark. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Rest of the day. Take care. Bye. Bye. That concludes today's episode. We want to thank you for listening all the way to the end. This episode was brought to you by Mars Crowd, your one-stop data labeling and collection service provider. For more info, feel free to click the website link in the description. We look forward to you tuning in for our next episode on how AI is changing society.